Hey everyone, this is a chapter reading for Itsy Bitsy Book Bits. Um, this is War of Destiny 3, Between Darkness and Light, by Teresa Van Spankerin. It's a prologue. My name is Julia Smith. Seventy-five years ago, I was married to a man named Gregory. He had been a cruel and violent man. And one night he murdered our daughter and nearly killed me altering my life forever. I was rescued by a vampire named Samuel, the leader of the vampire resistance. They desire to interact with humans more normally than just using them as a food, a food source. I agreed to join, this, to join his group to overthrow the king of the vampires, Valentino. In doing so, I was remind, reunited with my soulmate and childhood love, Adam. We learned that our group was different from others. We were cadet, souls bound by destiny for a purpose. I was happy. The eight of us were like family. Besides Adam and Samuel, there was Samuel's older fledgling, Matthew, and his soulmate, Christy. There were also Marianne and Jeffrey, who had become part of the cadet long before we did. Finally, we had been joined by Samuel's teacher, Valerie, who wasn't cadet, but was as close as anyone else could be. A few years ago, everything changed. Valentino came after us, determined to eliminate the threat to his power. Our only warning came to me through a dream from a ten-year-old human girl named Callie. Valentino kidnapped and tortured Matthew. When we fought, it was a disaster. We rescued Matthew, but we both lost our soulmates. And that wasn't even the worst part. I had been able to see into the future before, but when I needed it the most, my power inexplicably failed. Instead, I had nightmares with voices that insisted I was the one who had bungled everything because I had really wanted my group dead. Eventually, I started to believe the voices, and when Gregory appeared to me for the second time since becoming a vampire, he backed up those claims. It's hard to explain why I did what I did. I betrayed my cadet to Valentino. I nearly destroyed everything I loved. I had killed Jared, a member of the Resistance Council, and a friend. I had attacked Samuel and almost killed him. I heard a female voice then that reminded me that this wasn't who I wanted to be. Was it my conscience, as I believed? I don't know. I thought I saw my dead bastard of a husband. Does that make me insane? I honestly don't know the answer to that either. Chapter 1 Five years later, I found my situation only slightly changed. I had explained to Marianne and Jeffrey about seeing Gregory again, and they had accepted my account warily. I did not tell them about the voices or dreams. Having attempted to tell Samuel about it several times, I had learned to keep the information between Callie and me. All three of them believed my sanity is fragile at best, although I suspected Samuel thought I was completely insane now. Marianne and I talked regularly, while Jeffrey barely spoke to me. It was she who was teaching me Italian. I found out quickly that no one in Florence spoke English. In reality, they thought everything, anything English was pretty much venom. Matthew still, hasn't, still wasn't living with us. About a year ago, he started coming by occasionally, but it was only to see Samuel. And they left soon after he arrived. I never tried to get close, fearing what reaction I might receive from him, especially considering that we were still connected through the cadet. Yeah, that's right. Five years later, members not speaking to each other, and the cadet still holds. I am sure Matthew's thrilled, considering any time he, has, he was at the villa, his thoughts were shielded. I could still pick up a stray emotion sometimes. If I truly wanted to, I could probably read some of his thoughts or track him with the cadet, but that hardly seemed worth the trouble. Truly, how could I damn him for not wanting to deal with me after what I had done? 
Samuel's and my relationship had continued to deteriorate. When we had arrived five years ago, he would still carry on a halfway decent conversation with me. Now, though, he, barely, he rarely speaks to me at all. He would have been the logical choice to teach me and the children Italian, except Samuel was, had stubbornly refused. It was hard to believe he was still connected to us. Matthew shielded his thoughts quite well. Samuel shielded perfectly. Thoughts, emotions, all of it. Actually, it wasn't only me he did not talk to. He had withdrawn from everyone but Matthew. Tonight, I sat in my room, as I usually did nowadays, staring at a wilted white rose I had placed on the table a few days ago. It was my tribute to my soulmate, Adam, the anniversary of his death having passed seemingly unnoticed by anyone but me. With a sigh, I wiped a few tears from my cheek. I missed him terribly, although I questioned if I had any right to mourn after the destruction I had caused. For the millionth time, I wondered why the cadet was still intact and why I was still alive. A soft knock startled me out of my maelstrom of dark thoughts. It echoed through the empty villa. Nobody was home tonight. They had all left shortly after sunset, separately. Other than Stephen, who was going to a tavern, I had no idea where any of them went. I was not privy to that information any more. Julia, are you awake? Yes, I answered as I recognized Callie's voice. She was now fifteen, and had turned into a slender, pretty young woman. Neither I nor the others quite knew what to think of her, because despite her age, she, she, she seemed more like our equal in both maturity and to a lesser degree in power. My door opened a little, and Callie slipped inside, carefully closing it behind her. She turned to me, studied the rose on my end table, and sat down on my bed. How are you feeling? I glanced at her from the chair in front of the table. I'm alive, I answered with a sigh. She smoothed the skirts of her simple black dress and said, Thinking of Adam again, I see. A couple yellowish pale petals fell off in my hand as I shrugged. There was no point in answering her. She already knew. What do you want, Callie? I questioned tiredly. Have you had any more dreams, or have you heard the voices again? I closed my eyes and thought, There's the Callie I know. All business, when what I really want is a friend. No, Callie, there have been no dreams or voices, at least not dreams like that. Have you had any strange dreams lately? Turning in my chair, I glared into her gray eyes. I have only had dreams about my own foolhardiness. I can assure you that I'm perfectly sane at the moment. I never said you were not sane, Julia. You are the only one, I mumbled as I watched her. She was still, her hands clasped in her lap. She smiled slightly, her posture relaxed as she regarded me in turn. Have you tried to explain the dreams and voices to one of the other vampires? You know I have. Samuel thinks I'm even crazier afterwards. Have you ever considered that you are trying to explain it to the wrong person? I am quite certain Marianne and Geoffrey would be inclined to agree with Samuel if I try, I replied, and picked up the half-dead rose again. My thoughts drifted back to the last time I remembered being happy, the last time Adam and I danced together at the White Hart Inn. If I closed my eyes, I could almost feel his hands on mine. Julia, I looked blankly at Callie as I realized I had missed what else she had said entirely. What if you tried? Tried what? I'm sorry, my mind was somewhere else, I replied. Callie frowned slightly. What if you tried talking to Matthew about it? Studying her face, I waited for the laugh, a trace of a smile to show she was jesting. The expression on her face remained solemn. The frown deepening. Good Lord, this girl was serious. And they think I am the insane one. I matched her frown. How much wine did they have tonight? Did you have tonight, Callie? You're either drunk or more delusional than I am. Neither, I'm afraid, she answered. 
I tightened my right hand and felt rather than heard a soft squishing noise. When I opened it, there was a whitish yellow pulp where the rose used to be. I dropped it back on my small table. That would be the most futile attempt of them all, I said with a scowl. Matthew has not talked to me in five years. There is no way he will now. He does not have to talk. He only has to listen. Matthew is not going to listen. He did not want to hear anything I had to say then. He is not going to want it to hear it. He is not going to want to now. He despises me, and I honestly cannot blame him, I whispered. Why are you insisting that I explain that to someone? If what I suspect is true, you need help learning to control your abilities, Julia. If you suspect that, th that this is a power of mine, why don't you teach me? Callie sighed as if she was explaining something to a child who did not understand. I hate it when she sounds like that. Julia, I realize you seem to believe I know everything, but I do not. I think I have figured out what your gifts are, but I haven't the faintest idea how to teach you how to use them safely. One of your cadet would have a better idea than me. Sharp pain lanced across my forehead, and I winced and rubbed it. If you have it figured out, why don't you explain it to one of them? There was a moment of silence, and I glanced up at her. Her expression told me everything I needed to know. You already tried and failed, I presume. I have tried to discuss it with Samuel. I did not get very far, she said. I snorted and replied, Yet you somehow think I should talk to Matthew about it. Forget it. He has more right to hate me than anyone else, since I nearly turned him back over to the people who had tortured him. Why would he listen to me? Why would he even care? He is different than Samuel, and time may have given him a new perspective. He can help you. You and he are still connected through the cadet. You should try, Julia. Hmm, about that. Why are we still connected? Why do you think Matthew will not only listen, but help me when he has the least reason to? The expression on Callie's face changed, became unreadable. Your destiny is still entwined with theirs. I see what I see, Julia. What is it that you see, Callie? I asked. She shook her head. Could I see it too? Again, she shook her head. I glared at her and tried to read her mind to no effect. Just try to tell him, she repeated. Frustrated, I rubbed my temples, oblivious to the mush of flowers still in one hand. I am tired. It is time for you to leave. It is barely three hours past sunset. So? My head hurts, and there is nothing better for me to do that but sleep. Her, eye, her, gray, her eyes narrowed to smoky gray slits. When did you feed last, Julia? Get out, I snarled, and pointed to the door. Callie sighed, rose gracefully, and left my room. A couple of nights later, found me using a mirror to finish lacing up my black satana. I enjoyed the Italian dresses better than the ones I had worn in England. The bodice was lower, and high collars, higher collars weren't as popular yet. Using the valuable item had become routine for me since I rarely had help dressing any more. It was the only luxury I had in my room. The rest of my furniture consisted of a small bed, a closed chest, an old chair, my end table now bare except for a single candle. For a long moment, I stared at my reflection in the mirror, then shook my head. I did not know how to rectify the situation, how to repair the damage I had done. I simply prayed I would not have a nervous, another nervous breakdown. That would be disastrous. With a sigh, I turned and went downstairs. Marianne was serving supper to Callie and Stephen. Stephen was now twenty years old. The scrawny boy I had met a few years ago had turned into a well-built young man. Capable of duking it out with the most with most human men, yet I still thought of him as the son I never had. They welcomed me with warm smiles, familiar words of friendship. Friendship, in the villa we still spoke our own dialect of English, whereas outside of the building it was Italian. After greeting the humans, I looked directly at Marianne. Where's Samuel? In the library, as usual. I heard the faint hint of both disapproval as well as worry in her voice. 
I sighed mostly to myself. Thanks, I murmured, and headed down the hall. I stopped outside the closed door and stilled myself for any mood. I never knew what to expect from Samuel any more. Usually I received icy indifference, but occasionally he would be in some sort of rage. I did not bother to knock, but walked right in. There were still smoldering embers in the fireplace, and the faint orange glow was the only light in the room. Samuel was sitting in the darkest shadow, staring into space. "'Who is it, and what do you want?' he demanded. "'Well, good evening to you, too, Samuel,' I said. There was a heavy sigh. Then he turned to look at me. His eyes were frosty. "'What are you doing in here?' "'I came in to see you,' I replied, and took a couple of steps closer. "'How, so how thoughtful,' he said, with maddening indifference. "'What is it that you need, Julia? "'I'm going to be leaving in an hour to have a drink with Matthew.' I bit my lip in, in surprise. None of us had heard from Matthew in almost two weeks. Was it a coincidence that Samuel was supposed to meet him two nights after Callie's suggestion? How is he? I asked. He's having the time of his life. Florence has never been dull, you know. I hid a smile with effort. That might have been an understatement. A few years after we had arrived, the Duke Francisco and his second wife Bianca had died of fever. However, almost everyone in Florence believed that Bianca had accidentally poisoned her husband and then killed herself out of grief. Samuel resumed speaking. He is on good terms with the Medici family, including the Grand Duke Ferdinando I. I was silent a moment. The Medici family had ruled over Florence for over a hundred years. I was slightly surprised Samuel had mentioned Matthew, and even more surprised he had answered my question. However, if he was willing to talk about Matthew, I was certainly not going to deter him. It would be the first decent conversation we had had in about a month. All right, that's all, folks. Thanks.